without much ado, uh, I want to share uh, what excites me these days. Uh, I've been doing nutrition research, uh, as Beverly was saying, for a while, and a focus has been on how uh, our genetics influences what we need uh, and how uh, it makes the food we uh, consume every day more or less effective. But uh, for a good start, okay, I have to get this done. Like any uh, decent nutrition talk, let's start with a fairy tale. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with that, Goldilocks and the three bears. So the three bears ha had a very healthy meal, uh, but the porridge was too hot, so they took a walk. Good for them. But Goldilocks came in, she snuck in, uh, and then she tried uh, the porridge. And what she really was going for was the, just the right amount of nutrients in there. I mean, that's where the fairy tale gets a little bit wrong. So uh, she really didn't want to have too little iron. She didn't want to have too much iron. She wanted to have it just right. And here we come to the Goldilocks principle. And basically what the Goldilocks principle uh, says is that there is an amount that is just right for you. So it is described in scientific terms, but it's really the same uh, with this kind of bell-shaped uh, sh uh, bell curve, uh, which is a normal distribution. And you are more likely to be at the center of that distribution than a little bit off. Uh, and continuous variables such as weight, and exercise level, etc are the reason that you are not exactly on point. Now, of course, each of the three bears have their own uh, just right point. Uh, and this is reflected in current uh, dietary recommendations. So these are, in this example, uh, for iron, the recommended dietary allowances, the RDAs, as they are currently applied to all of us. And you have uh, different ones for ma females uh, and males, and different ones by age group. And I didn't list here uh, differences by lactation status, pregnancy status. But as you can see, uh, a young female would require about eight milligrams of iron per day, and that's it. It's the same for everybody. And then, of course, uh, there are various uh, influencing factors that influence nutrient requirements. So smokers, we have known for a long time, need a little bit extra, actually quite a bit of extra uh, vitamin C because the free radicals in smoke uh, basically destroy uh, the vitamin C. Uh, the same with aspirin. If you take a baby aspirin, how many of you take a baby aspirin? Okay, quite a few. Uh, you need a little bit extra. You need about twice as much uh, vitamin C as you would otherwise. For most people in the U.S., that's not a real problem if you follow general recommendations to get enough fruits and vegetables. Then uh, people who take diuretics, uh, which are in a lot of uh, blood pressure medications, and I'm sure a lot of you are on some kind of blood pressure medication where this uh, increases vitamin B1 requirements, thiamine requirements, and you should get some extra. Now, that's a difficult one because there are not that many good sources, uh, but if you have a well-balanced diet, you probably can do that too. Diabetes is another one, uh, and you have that list, so again, these are continuous variables, and you're a little bit to the left or the right uh, of the requirement curve. But overall, you're still uh, roughly uh, in range. Now, there is some room for getting a little bit more. But let me make very clear that more and more is not always better. So you really need to get enough 
but not too much. Uh, current recommendations recognize this. And in addition to uh, 15 years ago or so, when the previous recommendations uh, have been last updated, uh, there is now an additional value. We call them UL. Uh, it's short for the upper tolerable limit. And that's basically the amount uh, of a nutrient uh, that you can still take, safely take. But if you go beyond that, there is a concern about a risk. So in terms of iron, uh, there's a concern uh, for uh, too much iron de deposits uh, in the liver, in the heart, and in the brain. We know too much iron actually uh, interferes, particularly in older people, with brain activity because of the deposit slowly deteriorate uh, brain activity. So you want to get it just right. Goldilocks principle, right? So I thought about updating this, and uh, it's really, uh, everybody is really a little bit different. Now, it also, uh, I hope you catch this, they don't always eat local food. The penguins really on the other side of the uh, earth. So there's really a little bit more to it than just the Goldilocks principle. So fairy tale moving to science. Uh, when you look uh, at actually measured uh, requirement data, and here uh, I want to present something that is fairly well investigated, that is protein requirement in healthy people. And the assumption is, remember, it should be some kind of bell-shaped curve a normal distribution. Be a little bit heavier, a little bit lighter. You need a little bit more, a little bit less. And so people try to fit a bell-shaped curve into that. Well, I have difficulty with that. I really should have fit several bell-shaped curves into that. As you can see, there's clearly a, a main bulk of individuals who have a fairly modest uh, protein requirement, somewhere in the range of 0.6 grams per kilogram. Then there's another fairly sizable group that has about 0.9 grams uh, per kilogram. That's about 50% more. And then there are additional groups that have two or three times as much the requirement. So why is that? It's clearly a suggestion it's not one size fits all. We are not all the same. And this assumes uh, you're still in the same group. So you're still the same 50-year-old male, uh, but there's still 50, 100, or more percent difference. And this is actually one of the best investi investigated examples where you can really say, uh, repeat measurements, this is because people are different. It's not because on that day they needed a little bit more. It's who they are. So let's look very briefly at some of the reasons, and uh, of course I cannot cover uh, the whole range of reasons for that, why people are different. Well, a major reason is that people have adapted historically to very different environments. And here is an example that probably most of you are familiar with. That is lactose tolerance. Normally, mammals will tolerate milk. They have to. They are able to digest it when they are suckling and during early infancy. And the enzyme in the small intestine that is doing this digesting goes basically away after infancy. And there are reasons for that. I don't want to get into it. But it's a very uniform pattern, whether you have an elephant or a monkey uh, or a mouse. They all work the same way. Uh, the infants, the suckling uh, animals, uh, are able to digest lactose in milk. And when they get a little bit older, they're weaned, then they cannot tolerate readily 
uh, milk. But humans have fairly uniquely developed the ability to maintain this lactase expression. But not all humans. Only about 30% or so of the world population. And this is not a random event, but these are adaptations. And I wanted to uh, give you the examples. On the right, you're probably aware of that. Northern Europeans, they're derived from Vikings who have adapted to green isles where you had rocks and grass and not much else, some fish, I guess. So they were very much dependent on their dairy. And they adapted uniquely to it, and we can genetically uh, verify that. They have one change. It's one very specific change that we can measure. But if you go to other environments where they are also sparse, other populations adapted to what was available in terms of dairy to them, like the Tuaregs in the Sahara, or uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, they similarly adapted very specifically, and we can measure that again. The genetics reflect that. So the Fulani in the Sahel, that's south of the Sahara and West Africa, they are very uh, characteristic in that they depend on the dairy of their cattle. People in the same environment who are not from the Fulani do not carry this genetic variant. So it's adaptations. And it's the same thing for a lot of different nutrient. They all adapted. Another reason for why we are different, again, adaptation to the environment, but not just the nutrients, but also uh, illness-causing parasites and microbes. In this case, malaria was one of the most powerful forces to shape humanity uh, and resistance to uh, malaria is something that's very important. And basically, this is an example, G6PDH deficiency, which is an enzyme in red blood cells, uh, protects against malaria. So historically, populations were able to survive in this environment. But as an aside effect, they're very sensitive to the consumption of broad beans. They get hemolysis. Their uh, red blood cells just uh, open up. They break up. Uh, and this can be a fatal condition. So this would be an example where you buy yourself resistance to a very dangerous disease, malaria. And on the other hand, you have the downside that you have a food intolerance. So clearly, in an area where malaria is important and common, then that's a reasonable trade-off. But we all come from different areas. Some of us come historically from areas that had malaria, but others come from areas where there was no malaria. So some of us have some of these traits that influence then how we respond uh, to foods. And that is very typical why we are different. So what I would like to do, and I don't know how much I can cover, uh, how much you can bear with me, I want to go through a few very specific cases and do a few case studies uh, where I show you some of the examples uh, how these uh, genes, the different uh, genetic variants, interact with foods and nutrients that we get every day. Uh, to either have a favorable outcome or an unfavorable outcome. And mind you, what we are talking about here is uh, not rare. Many of these uh, genetic variants are very common. They occur maybe in a third of the population, maybe in 5% of the population. But we are never talking about something rare. So all of us have quite a number uh, of genetic variants that affect 
how food works for us, whether it's beneficial or not. So let me go to the first one. This is actually uh, an interaction that was among the first that was recognized and it has been investigated for the last 25 years or so. Uh, so it's reasonably well understood. And this is about the question, folate, uh, which is a vitamin, uh, can lower, or maybe not, homocysteine, which is uh, a marker for cardiovascular risk. You may have heard about it. Uh, it is very commonly measured uh, with regular labs. Uh, and basically, if you have an elevated level, you have an increased risk of uh, heart disease, myocardial infarction, and stroke. So, of course, the question is, how much of an effect does folate then have? Well, what you see here is a range uh, from a control study, a range of folate intakes from fairly low, 200 micrograms per day, roughly, to pretty generous, over 800 micrograms. And you can see a hint of a relationship. People who have a high intake, and that's about how much somebody who has a fairly well-balanced diet plus takes a dietary supplement, multivitamin, that's how much they would get, about 800 micrograms. So you see a very mild effect. Comes in uh, this genetic variant, and I don't want to get into these things in detail. I included them so that those among you uh, that are a little bit more interested in the technical aspects can read up on this. I just want to include it. Basically, uh, this is a, a gene that is important for how folate is used. Folate is a coenzyme that is activated by this gene. And there are two uh, different variants, C and T. And I'm going to present uh, for these following case studies pretty much the same layout. Uh, on the left, you see uh, the frequency uh, of these various uh, gene forms uh, in the pie chart. So what you can see here is um, the colors are a little bit off, but the green, I think you can still see it, the green is the most common form. Uh, that's the CC form. And there is a minor form, about 10% to 15%, in the normal population depends on uh, the origin, ethnic uh, origin, uh, have the TT form. And what you can see when you look at the green line, remember, we saw basically no effect from 200 to 800 micrograms of folate intake. And the green form, the common form, reflects that. There's almost no difference, so no benefit really, right? But if you have the TT form that 10 to 15% of you have, then you do have a benefit. And this translates, if you look on the right, uh, into a difference in homocysteine. And remember, I was saying this is a marker uh, for cardiovascular risk. So when you translate that, we predict it makes a difference uh, going from 400 to 800. That's the difference taking a multivitamin or not, for instance, of about 15% in myocardial infarction and 24% in stroke risk. Now, that's real stuff. Does anybody have a sense how much of a difference a statin makes with statin treatment? How many of you are treated with statins? A few, I assume. Uh, statins, somewhere in the range 10 to 15%. Uh, lower heart attack risk. So if you have this genetic variant, then it might be a good idea to get a little bit extra folate. Easy. Take a multivitamin, right? Well, nothing's easy. Certainly not when I'm presenting it. <laughs> so you take a folic acid multivitamin, right? 
or maybe just folic acid. And as we already saw, it probably will reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, I'm looking, I'm shifting a little bit here, I'm also looking at breast cancer risk because we know it also relates to breast cancer risk. And you get a hint, maybe 5% uh, difference when you take no vitamins versus you take multivitamin. And this, by the way, is uh, data from a very large uh, breast cancer study on Long Island where they basically compared women who had experienced breast cancer with women who did not but were the same otherwise, had all the same factors otherwise. They're about 5%. It's too small to really be statistically significant, but you get an idea that was a hint, and other investigations also kind of point in that direction. So that's all good, right? Well, maybe not. Because in comes, it's always uh, like in theater, the gene comes in. This is a gene that codes for an enzyme that activates the folic acid, which you have in dietary supplements and in fortified food. When you eat baked goods or any kind of flour, pasta, etc., it has been fortified with folic acid, you get about 150 or so micrograms per day from these fortified foods. And when it comes in, it has to be activated. And that's what this enzyme does. And as it happens, it also shows a difference. In this case, there's a 19 base uh, difference. Um, you don't have to know the, difficult, uh, the, the uh, details, but Again, here the pie chart. So uh, the form that is the minor form is about 15 to 20 percent among you. Okay? And look what happens. For those women that carried this form, the 15 to 20 percent women carried this form, look at the red line. They actually experienced a risk. I mean, more than 50% risk in breast cancer uh, when they used a multivitamin. Nothing else. They just used a multivitamin. So look at this. The green line, no difference. It goes a little bit down, maybe 5% uh, better with a higher folic acid intake, which we already seen before. But if you carry this uh, variant, then you may have a significantly increased risk. So it, it clearly there is something going on. Um, if we can now tell women, OK, you need enough folate, but you need it from food, which may be a little bit harder, you should not get the extra folic acid from cereals or from a multivitamin, or from other sources, from an energy bar, et cetera. Then you'll be good, because it's the folic acid, not the food folate that does this. So you see the difference. Let's move somewhere else. Calcium. Everybody knows calcium is good. So basically, um, if you take more calcium, you should absorb totally more, but uh, the body regulates uh, how much it absorbs. So um, part of this regulation occurs through vitamin D, and the vitamin D acts through a protein which takes the vitamin D, the activated vitamin D, takes it down into the nucleus of cells and binds there directly to the DNA and activates certain stretches of DNA uh, and make them work uh, as they should. For instance, they produce more collagen uh, for the bone or they produce proteins that are needed to deposit calcium in the bone, uh, etc. And again, there is a genetic variant uh, 
which is called uh, B, small b, uh, capital letter B. And if you have, from both parents, the capital letter B, uh, there is, has been the report from quite a number of studies that you might be more susceptible to osteoporosis. So you might need a little bit extra vitamin D. Uh, you might need extra vi uh, exercise to make up for that. Okay, so let's see how that works. And what we see is here, uh, the calcium absorption is not really affected much uh, differently by when you look at the red line and the green line, there isn't really much going on. So what is happening with bone? That's really what we ask. Is it beneficial to uh, get more calcium? So if you have this one variant, do you need more calcium? And what we see compared to the RDA level, the 1,000 milligrams or so uh, that you need that's recommended, there is no difference because everything happens in the low range of the intake. So somebody who has the unfavorable, the red line here, form, will be more sensitive at a very low intake. But that's not really the intake that you're getting because all of you will get at least seven, 800 uh, milligrams of calcium. There's basically nobody uh, in America who gets less because it's so readily available from all kinds of sources. Uh, most of you probably get somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 milligrams supplements, dairy, uh, fortified uh, juices, uh, etc. There are so many sources. So it's a non-issue. So this would be an example where we were very excited. Oh, you know, we got something. But follow-up research over the last 20 years or so basically found there isn't really much going on. If you get the right nutrition that applies to everybody, you are fine. This is not an interesting one. And this is a theme that is very important. I want you to remember that in many cases, original reports of such relationships will not be confirmed. So you will read about it. It will be the news factoid on CNN. Ten years later, it's all gone. This is an example. But let's stay with the calcium. So we know from studies that calcium may actually be a good thing to reduce your colorectal cancer risk, bowel cancer risk. And when you look at it, you see uh, this bar graph. Uh, people with low calcium intake appear to have a higher uh, colorectal cancer risk. So it's all good, okay? So those among you who get enough calcium are all good. And I said, you know, most of you will be above the 700 milligrams or so threshold. You probably will be more like above the 1100 threshold, okay? Well, as I said, nothing is simple. In comes a little weird channel. This is an iron channel. And don't try to read the name, TRPM7. I have to memorize that because I forget it by tomorrow. And basically, this is the channel through which both magnesium and calcium enters cells, both in the bowel lining, but also a lot of other cells. Okay, And as always, there is a common uh, variant, and it affects this channel. It still works. It works actually quite well, but just a little bit different. What does it do? Well, if you have this red one, the A allele, which is the minor allele here, you can see that if you go from this very minimal calcium intake to even normal intake 
look at that, 687 to 1100 milligram intake, your bowel cancer risk increases very significantly because you were taking calcium. So it's not all good. It's a minority, but how many among you have this? I may have it. I didn't measure mine. So you can see it. So the green line, there is a little bit, just like you saw in, in the bar diagram, there is a little bit of a benefit, but not if you have this other form. And why is that? Well, it has a lot to do with that this channel is very sensitive to an imbalance between magnesium and calcium intake. Somehow, it is more prone to uh, magnesium deficiency. It doesn't let it in as readily. And when it has to compete with too much calcium, then the magnesium is kind of shut out. If you get a lot of magnesium, then you're actually possibly better off than the people without that variant. Look at that red line. It actually goes lower, it means lower risk, than somebody who doesn't have it. So this is a little bit a jujitsu thing, you know? If you know how to do it, then something that may be a flaw, or look like a flaw in how we are made, may actually be an advantage because your risk may actually be lower. So you just need a little bit extra magnesium. We have a problem with getting enough magnesium because most of us don't eat enough of all the foods that have magnesium, which are particularly fruits, vegetables, and particularly whole grain cereals. So all the good stuff, if you eat that, you are perfectly fine. You may actually be better off than without that variant. And again, the variant is common. We're talking about something like in 20% or so of the people. Okay. I couldn't do any kind of presentation without talking about, you know, <laughs> the good stuff and what makes us fat. So let's admit all of us do that. But when you look at in large populations, how the body mass index, which is a measure for body fatness, relates to how much saturated fat we eat. What do you see? Nothing. Everything else the same, right? Same amount of total fat. This is looking only at how much fat you eat. So you get your fat, let's say, from a cheeseburger, somebody else, gets it from hummus with lots of olive oil. Same amount of fat, but doesn't do much, right? Well, if you have the right genes, it may make a difference. So here we're talking about apolipoprotein protein A2, and I can actually say that because I've been working with that for a long time, which is a protein which sticks on the fat particles in our blood. You remember the cholesterol in our blood, and there's a good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Now this sticks to the good cholesterol. It also sticks to the chylomicrons, which transport fat from the bowel to uh, muscle, uh, et cetera, where it's supposed to be used, or to the fat tissue where it gets stuck. Okay? Again, there's a variant in this case it's in the so-called promoter region, which means it's a region uh, near uh, the gene that is actually translated into a protein that controls how much of that protein is produced. That's kind of an on-off switch. And you can imagine if that on-off switch is slightly different, well, it's like a broken uh, light switch. It doesn't work so well then there's a difference, and there really is a difference. And when you look at populations, uh, you can find that, again, the common form, the green line, there is no effect of saturated fat, but if you have 
uh, the rarer form, which is again about 15, 16% among you, among us, uh, then you are likely to respond to just eating a burger instead of uh, your hummus with gaining weight over the years. And the difference is about two points or so in BMI. Uh, so that translates for a typical middle-aged male somewhere in the range 12, 14 pounds difference. And there's nothing, we're not talking about doing more exercise or uh, eating more. Basically, in these people, what the saturated fat does is it makes us more efficient. It makes us burn less energy. Good thing, right? Except we are struggling with weight, some of us. So again, you have uh, such a very significant difference. So I was saying after a few years, maybe we find out it is not true. So you do a few follow-up studies, and you cannot confirm that there actually is this kind of difference. And let me emphasize here, uh, a lot of scientists uh, really balk at this, but most newly published findings will not be confirmed. That's just a scientific fact. That's why we have to do follow-up studies. That's why uh, we have to confirm findings. Life is never easy, but it keeps us you know, in bread and butter. So the question is, somebody finds this and say, oh, you know, all we have to do now is measure this and then help people who have this variant to eat less saturated fat. Easy. So I said not all of these, actually the majority of these relationships will be confirmed. This is one that actually has been confirmed very consistently now. Uh, and I'm showing just five different populations, and they span the whole range from uh, Caucasian Americans, Puerto Rican Americans, Framingham offspring, uh, Spanish people, uh, Indians, Malaysians, uh, and Chinese on, on the right. They're all bundled into the same. And you see the same relationship. Basically, the ones that have the T variant, you see that marked on the right? There is no difference in BMI uh, when they have extra saturated fat. So when they have a high saturated fat intake, you will not find any relationship to the BMI. They are not fatter. Regardless, you know, I mean, people in China are not all that fat. You still can see that effect. When you look at the CC, which is the minor form that is responding to the saturated fat. So this is a winner. So this is the kind of genetic variant that we certainly would be interested in because then we can target and say, OK, you know, this is something you can do. It's not even about eating less or more. It is about what you eat. Yes, it's going to be hardship. You may have to eat your burger without cheese. It's not that easy, but it's very similar to what we already do for blood cholesterol lowering and what is very beneficial there. OK. Let's move on to some of the research that we have done here on choline. You may have heard quite a few uh, presentations on choline. This actually was the first one we did here uh, where we looked at the genetics. And choline, as you know, uh, is in soy, but it's also uh, in large amounts in eggs. One of the reasons why today we don't really warn off eggs uh, it's probably a good idea to get a couple a week, not too much, but a few. And when you look at uh, the effect of the intake, and we did uh, control studies where we basically locked up people for two or three months and fed them exactly what they had to eat, and they didn't always like that, and uh, because people go after choline, actually. It's, uh, there's a craving, actually. So you find uh, pr participants sneaking down to the cafeteria at, at midnight and picking up a pizza, which throws you a study. So 
basically, what we found is, you know, the estimated requirement uh, that we measured through these studies ranged from less than two, because the body can make choline itself, women better than men, as so many things, uh, to more than 12 uh, uh, milligrams per kilogram, quite a bit. So some people actually need that egg, and others don't. Okay. So of course the question was, what influences that? Why are some people different? And this is uh, an enzyme uh, that is responsible for basically bringing the carbon units from the mitochondria to where they are used for choline synthesis. It's quite a few steps. And this is what you see here. It's the MTHFT1 uh, gene. And there's a variant again. And it's actually fairly common. And when you look at it, you have to look at it a little bit closely. The GG variant, which is actually our ancestral variant, that is what we came with a million years ago. This uh, variant you basically have nobody who needs more than six or so milligrams per kilogram choline. But people who have this variant, they are 60% of the population, look at the pie chart. There, there are quite a few, 25% or so, that have a requirement of at least eight milligrams, and some of them even higher. We have now identified additional genes that explain uh, why people are different. So it's not just this one, it's a very powerful one, but it is an example. And what I see it as, it's probably an adaptation to Ice Age uh, eating a lot of meat, because meat has a lot of choline. So some people are adapted to that, and others are not. We're coming to a close. I hope we still have a little bit of time. So I'm not talking about eating goldfish, but uh, <laughs> fish oil uh, is a very important uh, source of omega-3 fatty acids. And we need a certain amount. Uh, it's a vital uh, nutrient, an essential nutrient. So one research group in California uh, was looking at the thickness of the arteries uh, on the neck. And we know the narrowing increases uh, stroke risk. But it's also a reflection of atherosclerosis in the body. So thick is not good. Thinner is better. Uh, what they found is by intake of these omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil, there was no difference. But they thought, OK, there is this activator that produces a, a messenger, an eicosanoid, uh, that is important. It's a hormone-like substance in the body that signals inflammation, but also promotes growth and things like that. So this uh, enzyme. Uh, is responsible for activating uh, the fatty acid, the omega-3 fatty acid, into this messenger uh, substance. And depending on where it starts, from an omega-6 fatty acid, like you have in most oils, uh, or from uh, the DHA, which is uh, the active substance in fish oil, you get a, a mediator substance that is more or less pro-inflammatory, promotes more or less inflammation, uh, which is not a good thing for your arteries, because we now know more inflammation at the level of the arteries uh, means more atherosclerosis. So there's a difference again. And true enough, if you have very low intake of uh, these omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil particularly, then uh, 
if you have the rarer variant, which about you know, slightly less than 10% of people carry, then you have a thicker artery. So that's not a good thing. But if you have anywhere near what you need, which is where the blue line is, that's where the RDA is, there's no effect. So again, a dud. We don't need to worry about it, right? Well, nothing is simple. Yes? Nothing is simple because, I told you, it depends on the starting material. An arachidonic acid is a long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid. It's an omega-6 fatty acid, which is particularly in the membranes of meats. And it's also in eggs. Now, there is a difference. Again, look at the green line. There is no effect. But the red line, it goes way up. So depending on your intake, it goes up and up and up if you have this uh, minor uh, form. So it might be good to know. Because if you can curtail your fat intake, your egg intake, this arachidonic acid intake, the effect is probably comparable to stopping smoking or not having diabetes in terms of thickness of your artery. That's how much of a difference there is. Now, if we didn't know the difference, we would never see this. Only when we separate out by genetic variant. So let me close this uh, whole thing by looking at coffee. This is from a study that was done in Costa Rica. And, you know, they have good coffee. Yeah. And people drink a lot of coffee there. And some of them drink too much, and they have an increased risk, particularly men, of myocardial infarction. Okay? And that's what this bar graph shows. And you see, it's not really earth-shaking, but you can see it. One cup's good, two cups, yeah. But four plus cups, that may be a little bit too much. So, again, the enzyme, this is an enzyme in the liver which basically detoxifies a lot of uh, compounds, including medications, uh, for excretion. And it's the most important one for caffeine. Uh, of course, we can assume this is the active ingredient that makes us uh, more prone to a heart attack. And if you have a more active form, then you should be able to tolerate more caffeine, right? And this is precisely what you see. Uh, here, uh, the variants fall almost half and half. So these things are very common. So we can count down. Half of us have this one variant, and the other half is the other variant. And when you look at the green one again, there is basically no effect. You're good to go with your four, five, six cups of coffee. Full strength. But if you have the other form, then it might be a good idea to stop after one coffee, uh, cup of coffee or just take your decaf. And mind you, there is no doubt the same goes for any other source of caffeine. So when you take your Mountain Dew, you know, same difference. And the difference is even just one or two cups extra. So from one to two to three cups, not a big difference, right? There's a difference in more than a third increase in risk. So somebody who drinks these two to three cups, say, may not want to do that. And again, Remember, statins, 10, 15%. This is more, and it's a very simple thing, but most people don't know. So 
how can you bring this all together? And if your head's not spinning by now, you're better than me. Because this is just the beginning. There are literally hundreds and thousands of these variants that all in some way, with some nutrients, with some kind of food, work together and make a difference. And if you can navigate this, there can be a lot of benefit. So how can that be done? And we are working on this in the very early days. Uh, this is the first one that has ever been done. Uh, it's a pretty tough one because I want to emphasize one thing. Genetics are not toys. It's not something that you can just use and spread and, you know, send somebody a report. You have these 19 genetic variants uh, or like some of these big sites, Navigenics, 23andMe, uh, et cetera, say, have parties with your neighbors and friends, compare your genes. They literally put that on their websites, because if you have an increased risk, your insurance company might, might want to know that. And it's never going, to, uh, never going away, because once it's on file, that's you. It's a label on your forehead. So one of the major interests that we are following here is how to use this securely, safely. And you don't want to worry, oh, I have this gene, and you worry about it years and years. You don't need to know. Your physician doesn't need to know. Your life insurance, your health insurance doesn't need to know. Your employer doesn't need to know. Nobody needs to know. So we developed an online program that does exactly that. It gives you guidance uh, without letting anybody know. And I'm just going to go in the last two, three minutes through this uh, to give you a sense of what we are trying to do here. Basically, uh, we are doing, we're measuring the genetic uh, variants. And you input your personal uh, circumstances, your weight, your height, age, etc., And then this uh, basically uh, shows you uh, a meal plan by day. So day by day, you want to fill that uh, with menus that meet exactly your needs. And you have to find those menus yourself. So it helps you look through uh, offerings, and you can change it a lot. Um, you can look through a number of different choices that are being offered. Uh, if there's something you don't like, so you don't like oatmeal, no problem. You look for a replacement, and it shows you uh, directly what might be uh, suitable. Uh, you can get the detailed information on the nutrient content of individual food, and it also takes you to cooking sites for recipes, uh, like Cooking Light or Southern Living, for uh, foods that you might want to use. So you have all the information and the pretty pictures uh, in there. So I want to conclude uh, with these key lessons that I hope I got across today. Uh, so I think there will not be much doubt that there are some genetic variants that really make a difference in how much we need. In many cases, we don't know for certain yet which ones they are. There's a lot of work needed because each of these relationships actually requires a full study or 10. But there's no question that they are very powerful effects and that if we can bring them to bear on our lifestyle, that we can benefit in the long term. This is not something that happens very quickly maybe with the exception of the extra cup of coffee. I do want to emphasize again that many of these uh, interactions will not be confirmed. So we're very happy to find something, and very often it will go away. So you have to understand 
until there's really very solid science, you really confirm it, uh, it may well be that a particular one um, will go away and we will have to say, nah, it really doesn't play that role that we thought it would. But we are usually not worse off because most of these changes really are overall in line with what we should be eating. So if you get a little bit extra magnesium, so be it. Sometimes there are differences. I do want to emphasize again that genetic information is not trivial, certainly not in the uh, context of nutrition. We shouldn't think nutrition, uh, that's easy. It's not uh, a dangerous thing. There is harmful uh, information uh, in there. I have been working 20 years ago very much on apolipoprotein E variants, uh, and then it was confirmed, and I was working on that in relation to vitamin K requirements, uh, and then Alan Roses at Duke and his coworkers found that this is the major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So suddenly it transforms into, you know, a nightmare. And you don't really want to know that. So these things are not trivial. So it has to be handled by professionals, has to be handled in a safe way. And I do want to offer for all of you that you can participate uh, in our studies. Uh, for those of you that don't do it already, uh, it's free of charge. Uh, the genetic variants will be determined. You will never get the results. It's totally anonymous, but it gives you access with or without the genetics to this uh, meal planning program uh, and this is where we really want to go provide the information that can help you personalize what you eat your lifestyle uh, based on who you are uh, some things are shared with a lot of others uh, in your cohort and a lot of things are not shared so questions Yes. How do you do the genetic? How do you get my genetic blood? There are many different ways. The question was, how do you get the genetic uh, information? Uh, DNA is contained uh, in all cells, so we can do a, a smear from uh, the mouth. Uh, it can be from saliva. We do it with blood because we get additional information, metabolomics, uh, etc., from that. Um, that's probably the best way. You, you can sign up by sending me an email. Uh, you can also, uh, at the counter, leave your name. We will contact you. Uh, and then we arrange for an appointment to have your blood taken. And you can use uh, the program. Well, very much so, because we don't really know how to do that best. We have an idea, but it's a very strong interaction. You can imagine how hard it is to actually change your diet. So, yes. I'll try. Sorry. Yes. If you're already part of the study, you have my blood, you have other samples as well. Could we use that or you have to start fresh? So, the question was uh, if somebody already participated in a study, uh, can those samples be used? And the answer is no. We, because this is anonymous, we don't keep your names. So there might be some that are already participating. I wouldn't even know. Uh, well, yes? Is there any influence of sodium salt on calcium magnesium intake? So the question was, um, is there a, a difference uh, an, an impact uh, by sodium. Yeah. There is a minor uh, impact, but of course, uh, sodium itself uh, is, is a very important one for blood pressure because some people are sensitive, others are not, and various enzymes have been identified that basically predict whether you are sensitive to sodium intake or not. Right. 
So the question was whether these variants change uh, over time. But because it's genetic uh, information, it never changes. You're born with it. You die with it. Uh, the only you basically have to work with what you come with. And as I showed you, in some cases, what may look, you know, a bad hand that you were dealt, it actually may be an advantage. So it really depends very much with these common variants, very much what you do with them. How much so, of the... So the, the, the question was whether your metabolism changed over the time. Uh, that is true. Somebody could be uh, sensitive uh, later in age and not sensitive earlier in age. We have such uh, differences. That is correct. Thank you. So the question was uh, that you will not know the DNA results, but the program will know it. So the DNA results, the genetic analyses are entered into the database, and the program then, without me doing anything, uh, automatically directs you to what is right for you. So, you know, it's not between you and me. Uh, it's basically between you and the computer. Can there be any influence of epigenetics on these variations? So the question was, are there epigenetic uh, influences? And uh, those of you who heard Dr. Nicolescu's presentation last week will understand, yes, there are influences. And... Uh, it gets very technical, uh, but there are interactions between the genetic differences and basically these epigenetic t uh, differences that determine whether a gene has been turned on or turned off. Does that yes. address the question? Yes. So the question was, does the program uh, take into account medications? Currently, it does not. Eventually, we will add all this in. But right now, you know, this is just a beginning. Uh, but it could be. But on the other hand, it would make a difference. As far as we know, to, to my knowledge, there is no uh, genetic variant that would lead us to a different recommendation. Does the program give information on supplement uh, needs, too, in addition to just the menu, you need to take these additional vitamins, mineral supplements? So the question was whether the program provides information about dietary supplements. And the answer is yes and no, uh, fairy tale territory. Uh, there are a few, currently, a few commonly used supplements that uh, can be added, but the benefit of this program is for most nutrients, you don't need a supplement. You certainly don't need a multivitamin, for instance, which we now know the Institute of Medicine uh, a few years ago has kind of come to that conclusion, does not provide a benefit. Uh, you just get enough of everything you need. The, supplements that we currently include, but this is very little and will certainly grow, uh, are largely vitamin D and fish oil because those are very difficult to get in adequate amounts uh, from foods. Doesn't your body make what, what you know, give it? Make it, make it, make it so the question was whether the body makes what uh, it needs and doesn't get from food, but that's the definition for, of essential nutrients that the body cannot make it. There are some nutrients like choline. They're kind of in between. The body makes some, but for many people, it doesn't make enough. But if you have something like uh, vitamin B1 or calcium, the body cannot make uh, its own. Sometimes it can adapt, but usually 
below the optimum. Does your body ever give you a clue on what's good for you and what's not? Like, I sit next to this guy who doesn't like broccoli at all, can't even stand the smell of it, and I love it. Is that, is that a clue on our genetic differences? I would say yes. So the question was, the question was, these two, one likes broccoli, the other one doesn't, and does the body know the difference based on genetics? Uh, there are genetic differences in bitter taste receptors. They have been investigated. If you have one kind, and again, we are talking about common differences, obviously. If you want, have one kind, you really don't like, and I'm talking about the bitter taste, that has nothing to do with the smell. Uh, and in other cases, you don't like it. Uh, so, yes, absolutely, we are driven by a lot of things. We know there are differences uh, in appetite. Uh, some people have a greater appetite than others. Some people are easier uh, sated than others. Uh, so there's a lot of genetics that works into that. Um, and, you know, it will be really great to be able to work with all those things. But uh, it's only always a little facet. So in this particular case with the broccoli, um, there are probably a, very, a number of different genetic differences between the two of you that determine that. But probably, <laughs> probably, I'm not getting into counseling here. <laughs> Probably a lot of it is also simply how you brought up uh, what you uh, experienced. Even uh, when you're breastfed, we know that makes a big difference, particularly for broccoli. Um, <laughs> it has been investigated. It does. Um, and let me address, you know, this much vaunted uh, sense of the body that the body knows what it needs. Sometimes it does, but most often it doesn't because otherwise, you know, all of us would be very trim and would get all the nutrients we need. We don't. So it's somewhere in between. Uh, there is some regulation, but it doesn't work terribly well in many circumstances. Yes, sorry. This is uh, a sort of a curveball for, for which I'm actually not going to have an explosion in knowledge about genetics and diet and disease predictability, which could lead to easy identification of uninsurable status. Uh, right now we have a lively public debate in the United States about <coughs> mandatory purchase of insurance as a matter of national policy. I wonder if you could comment on the collision between this increasing predictability of disease status and political debate that we are currently having about whether people must be insured. You don't expect me to repeat all of it, but the, the main uh, thrust, if I get it right, is uh, that the more we know about genetics and what we predict to be health risks, uh, the more it might collide with insurability uh, and the ability to, to, to really provide a commercial insurance, um, and that's absolutely right. There are a number of genetic improvements, the Slaughter Act, which does forbid uh, discrimination uh, on, based on genetics. But we know from worldwide experiences, particularly in Belgium, where such safeguards have been introduced many years ago, and they were routinely sidestepped. Uh, the best protection is if nobody knows. So my recommendation for everybody is uh, don't ask about genetics unless it's something really important. Uh, if you do that, make sure the information comes from a genetic counselor, competent genetic counselor based on good genetic uh, analysis, and don't share it with anybody. So if you have your genome test uh, done, this is not something to be shared. I think you have been waiting.
can you retest the blood at that point, or can we, or if somebody's in there, can you submit an additional sample and get additional results? That's my first question. The second is, are you part of this study, and has it changed what you eat? <laughs> <laughs> the second question first, which was, do I participate in the study? No, because, you know, I can't really study myself well. Oh, but it's it breaks anonymity. The first question was, what about follow-up uh, genetic analyses? Uh, and the answer to that is, yes, we will add uh, more. So if you would stay with that uh, additional genetic variance, we do a very limited number just to, for proof of concept, uh, can be added. Uh, because you need very little DNA. Uh, and eventually, you know, we are within a few years of the $1,000 uh, whole genome sequencing uh, where we can expect that literally hundreds and thousands of such uh, interactions will be brought into such uh, a, a meal planning system and it can easily accommodate that. So you could successively every year add a few more to the old samples if you're still on board. But two years from now, if I do it day one, two years from now, if I go to that own site study, it won't change from what I got today? Or, or it probably would change. Right now, what we are doing is a two-month uh, pilot demonstration study. But what the, the goal is, is to do this basically very long term, because obviously, uh, you want to be able to uh, follow up on a risk, let's say breast cancer risk, and you need to do studies that are seven or ten years long. Uh, and yes, it would change. And that's the power. And let me, let me emphasize, it has changed. When I started out, I did all my own studies. I swallowed all the tubes, all the unpleasant stuff, made sure I did it all myself. This is the easy stuff because there's no unpleasantness involved. Yes? As far as, uh, you know, in foods that are processed, it's, it's a highly processed, you know, corn syrup. Uh, what is your opinion? Is, do, you think, do you think it's good for you or bad for you? Some people say it's bad for you, and others say it's, you know, good for you. And, and so the question for, was, high uh, fructose corn syrup, syrup, is it good for you or is it bad for you? And, right. uh, you know, language uh, is malleable. Uh, it's good for you in the sense that it tastes good, but it's bad for you in the sense that it's bad for your health. It's very simple. Uh, it's not uh, specifically the high fructose corn syrup. It's any kind of uh, sugar, particularly the fructo fructose containing sugar, whether it's cane sugar uh, or the kind of syrup. So you want to really keep a little bit of lid on that. So you don't want to you don't want to consume much of that. No. That's what I was thinking. Exactly. Exactly. Thank yes. you. Okay. So there were two questions. One, should you cook uh, your vegetables like broccoli and carrots? Uh, that's a very easy question. Yes, you should, uh, at least a little bit, because uh, the uh, carotenoids, the vitamin A in it, uh, the vitamin K in the broccoli, and other good stuff in there is not released unless uh, you cook it, you at least brace it a little bit. You don't want to do it very much. You don't want to leach out anything. You can microwave it very briefly. It breaks up the cell, which in plants is very, it's a very protective 
uh, shell and leg uh, in animal cells. Uh, so definitely, if you're chewing uh, carrots, it's a tiny fraction of the carotene, the vitamin A in there, that you actually can absorb most of it, unless you chew really well. You really have to chew down the cells. Um, so uh, that was the first question. The second question was uh, whether you should listen to Dr. Oz. No, that's not what you asked. <laughs> whether, whether you should uh, have the fruits before the main meal. And uh, it's not an entirely bad idea because simply, uh, you know, like probably your mother told you, uh, don't spoil your appetite by eating something before uh, lunch or dinner. Well, it, that's a, maybe a good idea to spoil the appetite. So it cuts your appetite a little bit and you might eat less. That's the main reason. Other questions? One more. No more. Thank you. Yes. So I can't translate the emphasis, but the content was why are we exposed to high uh, fructose corn syrup? and trans fats if we know it's not good for us. Um, yeah, why? Actually, it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> actually, actually, it's mainly in there because it's easier for the producer. It prolongs shelf life. A lot of uh, foods that do not contain this tend to taste better. So you will not find this in a good restaurant food. You find it on fast food that's sitting on a shelf for a week, uh, the Danish from last year. Uh, <laughs> but if you get a fresh Danish that has been prepared that morning, there's no need for any trans fats, for instance. So, but it's a very good question. Uh, I think we know a lot about what is good in foods and what's not good in foods. And it were, would be really great if food producers would take a little bit more of heat. Some of them do. It's, they're moving, but it's a very slow change. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>